Uh, good evening, I'm Mike from here. I uh, have the pleasure of serving on the board here at Caldwell. And our board chairwoman, Kristen Carlock, was, was here this morning uh, to deliver a message, but she can't be here this evening. So she requested that I share this with you. And uh, on behalf of her and, and the board. So one of the things we love about Caldwell is its Christ-centered approach, filled with people like you who genuinely care about their children's education. So thank you for being here tonight. So if you please join with me as we open in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you are sovereign, truthful, and forgiving. Holy above all others. You gather us together in this continued faith journey. Trusting in you, we join one another as a community of parents, educators, administrators, and friends. A community of faith that's here tonight, concerned for our children and the future of Caldwell Academy. Allow us to be ever mindful of your presence, to open our hearts and minds to you. Allow us to hear your voice of wisdom through Sam in, in this discussion. Over the past week, some, some have been hurt with quick and adversarial rhetoric. We felt the sting of pointed comments, heard the belittling of hard, conscious, and faithful work. And in this process, we have forgotten that we are all made in your sacred image. We ask for your forgiveness, uh, that, that, that you forgive things that need to be forgiven, heal what needs to be healed, and renew us and put us on a fresh path that points toward you. So please be with us here tonight and guide this conversation to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay. I'm pleased to introduce Sam, who's served as head of school for about a year and a half. Uh, but before so, I'd like to share one thing. We, the board believes that Sam is talking, is taking on something here that's been part of Caldwell Academy for many, many years. Um, but it's been somewhat unclear to many of us. So he's providing structure, oversight, transparency, and guidance to this process. We have seen him bring order and structure to other areas of Caldwell, and we applaud him and fully support him for doing the same for our tuition assistance process. So, Sam? It's not snowing yet. <laughs> not supposed to come until 5 a.m., so that means I got you for about 10 hours before you drive home safely. Uh, thanks for coming out. This is truly a blessing for me, uh, just on, on many accounts. It's, it's a great blessing for me to, um, to be a Caldwell, to have been called not only by board directors, but called by the Lord himself to, uh, to this uh, humbling task of being at school here at Caldwell. And it is my great privilege to do that. And it's my great blessing and privilege to, to be before you here tonight as I rise uh, this morning for another group, uh, just to talk about the school in a very transparent way, and that's the way I do business. It's just up front, very transparently, and that that is a piece of this variable tuition. It's really um, having transparency, and we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. Um, but it's um, it is a great blessing for me to be here, so thank you for taking the time out of this cold night. I uh, wanted to provide a little history and context initially, and then I'll provide a little overview of this, uh, this movement, which is really not much movement, uh, philosophically exactly what we've been doing for many years um, to this variable tuition model. Um, and, and then there'll be an opportunity for your questions, and really encourage you to just be candid, whatever comments and questions you have, uh, we're here to learn from one another, so I encourage you to do that. Virtually every college and university, and essentially every K-12 private school, independent school, offers financial aid, um, often called tuition assistance. Typically, tuition assistance is need-based discounted tuition. A 
occasionally, but rarely, is it a scholarship pool of money that's distributed. It is revenue not received. It's discounted tuition. And um, that is the model that, again, most colleges and universities have used for several generations, and K-12 private schools have used. And um, you know, this is the sixth private school that I've worked in. Everyone operate, all of them operate virtually the same in terms of a tuition assistance program that a percentage of people receive discounted tuition. They don't pay the full tuition price uh, based on demonstrating need. When Caldwell opened its doors 21 years ago, they adopted the same model. Wanting this school to be a school that was open to mission-appropriate families that desire for their children to have a Christ-centered class of education, regardless of their ability to pay. Wanting to be not a school that was inaccessible to a large segment of the Greensboro community, but that would have families in the upper tier, and the middle tier, you know, really running the gambit uh, of uh, ability to pay. And um, so they adopted a model of tuition assistance where you would have um, uh, the, the tuition is listed on the website, listed on the contract, and, um, but for a percentage of the families, if they had a demonstrated need, they could apply through an independent third-party vendor for a number of years, we've used an organization called FAST, F-A-S-T. It's a division of independent school management, uh, typically called ISM. And you apply through this third-party vendor. They make a recommendation for what your ability to pay is. And it's based not just on salary and income. It's based on uh, a number of factors. Um, income, and assets, and mortgage, debt and uh, the number of children you have, the number of children you have uh, enrolled in private school, uh, and they, they have a formula. And then they make a recommendation back to our business office and our uh, tuition assistance committee, which is a very small confidential committee, they have three of us. And um, so they make a recommendation for what the tuition level will be for those families. And um, so this is the way that we've operated for 21 years, um, and it's the way uh, Reedsburg Day, Canterbury, Westchester, Wesleyan Christian, High Point Christian, uh, and really you can name almost every school in the United States that's an independent school, is the way they operate. And um, so um, this movement to a variable tuition, sometimes called index tuition, two or three different names for it, and we're calling it variable tuition, is it works exactly the same way. It's really no different at all, other than really the presentation, the marketing, to really, be quite frank. It creates a greater degree of transparency of, okay, this is our tuition range that we have. Percentage of our families receive a discounted tuition. They pay a little bit less. And um, so it puts those numbers out there. Um, and it attracts people that think maybe they can't pay. You know, we have found, and other independent schools around the country have found, that many families take one look at the school's website and they get sticker shock. Tuition is 5000 10000 20000 30000 whatever school's uh, tuition might be. They say, well, I can't afford that. They never go to page two of the website. They never pick up the phone and ask questions. They never have a campus visit, look at classrooms. And, and really, for a school like Caldwell, so often 
when people come on campus, they get a tour, they visit classrooms, they fall in love, and they want to send their children here. Some of those families that might have had sticker shock at the outset don't qualify for this kind of tuition, but they've graced our doors, they've met teachers, they've seen students, they've been in classrooms, and they're going to make sure, whatever way possible, that they're going to send their children here, even if they continue to pay um, the full tuition price. But others might receive a bit of tuition assistance, discounted tuition, and, but it gets them in the door, they're not as scared away. And so, um, over the recent years, as a growing number of independent schools are moving to this model of in-depth preparable tuition, schools are finding a tremendous, most schools, uh, not everyone, and not everyone in their first year, but overwhelmingly they're finding a uh, very significant increase in the number of inquiries, an increase, a significant increase in the number of applications, significant increase in the number of new admissions and an increase in retention and therefore an increase in enrollment. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute. Um, but let, let's look at current, you know, where we stand uh, with tuition and, and then we'll look at uh, some demographics here. This gives you this current year that we're in, 2015-16 school year. This is the top range of tuition. Um, top range is, is your highest, uh, like your high school is typically the highest. In the case of Canterbury, they only go through eighth grades, and that's their highest. But this is our tuition this year for the rhetoric school, $9,900. Greensboro Day School, 21 7. Canterbury, see that, over 15. New Garden Friends, just under 19. Westchester Country Day, 16. Wesleyan Christian, almost $1,000 more than us. Uh, these asterisks are other classical Christian schools. Uh, Trinity School of Durham, who's in our gym right now playing us in basketball. Uh, they're almost $20,000. Uh, very, very similar mission and vision as us, so it's very light school, even though it's in a different geographic area. Uh, Trinity Academy of Raleigh, another of our sister class of Christian schools, about 13,000. Burlington Day, about 17. Greensboro Montessori, you see that. North Raleigh Christian. Uh, Regent School of Austin and the Bear Creek School in suburban Seattle. Obviously, they're not in our geographic region. But those are two of the classical Christian schools nationally have about 300 that are most often compared to Colville. And you see 15-6 um, uh, for Austin and then at Bear Creek 21-295. Now obviously none of you, you, know, we don't, you as parents don't consider them the competition. You're not choosing to send your kids to the Bear Creek School in Seattle or Caldwell Academy here in Greensboro, obviously. Um, unless you have a job offer from Microsoft, maybe you would be. But they are a competitor because I'm trying to recruit and retain the very best teachers and administrators in the nation. And the, many of them are looking at classical Christian schools, the 300 or so spread across the nation. And so we compete against all of these other classical schools, but these two in particular, and, and these two as well, for staff members. And there's a direct correlation between tuition and faculty and staff salaries compensation. So they're, they're competitive in that sense. New Covenant School in Lynchburg, which is, uh, uh, Lynchburg is probably about a 20% a good 20% lower cost of living than us. Uh, their tuition is about a thousand less. High Point Christian, which is not classical, uh, a Christian school, uh, about 9,000. So you can see by this, we may not be the cheapest 
school and the triad, but we're one of the cheapest. And we're significantly cheaper than many of the other schools in the triad throughout the state and the nation. And yet, I would say um, the quality of education here to get the Christ Center rigorous classical education, it, it's a great education that your children are receiving for uh, a bargain price. This current year here with our tuition assistance program, the discounted tuition, 25% of our families, which is about 18% of our students, currently receive tuition assistance. This is discounted tuition, revenue not received. Again, it's not a scholarship pool. Um, we don't have a $100 million endowment where we, uh, the return on the endowment you know, goes into a scholarship fund. Uh, the majority of schools have this discounted tuition. 25%, 20 to 25% is our norm, certainly uh, since the Great Recession. Um, that represents 74 families, 113 students. 19 of those 113 students, 12 of those 74 families, are faculty and staff children. About 5.5% of our budget this year is allocated towards tuition assistance, which is about $345,000 in a $6.5 million budget. With next year, the anticipation that variable tuition may mean that we have a few more people that receive discounted tuition, we have budgeted um, another 5% or so, which means a total of about 6.2% of the budget allocated towards tuition assistance. Now that's, um, tell you a little bit about private school budgeting process. Maybe if you have young kids, or if you can remember when you were a young kid and you played Pimentel on the docking, that's, that's the business model. Because we set tuition in December, and we set our expenses in December. How many teachers are we going to have? What kind of pay raise? How much are we going to pay them? What's our athletic budget, curriculum budget? So we set those expenses in December, and we have no earthly idea what our revenue will be. Are we going to have 600 students, 680 students, 710 students? We just guess the best way that we can. And then as we get closer from December until we open doors the third week of August, and we look around and we count heads and say, okay, well, this is the revenue that we now have. So we predict the percentage of our budget for next year that we will have for um, uh, tuition assistance. It's our best educated guess. The other school, or at least from the census data that I've collected, um, the schools that have gone to this variable tuition model have not seen much, if any, increase in the number of families or students that receive tuition assistance. If you go by their statistics, there's no need for an increase in the budget. It would stay about this. But we've allocated additional money um, with that uh, potential. So, the, um, um, currently and historically, our tuition assistance serves 20 to 25 percent of our families, and um, these are families that have a demonstrated financial need, again, based on a variety of factors, applying through a third party confidentially in the school management we then make a recommendation to us, uh, our small group of three on the uh, admission, well, not admissions, the, the tuition assistance committee, and um, they just, they give the recommendation and an award is made based on their recommendation, but also our budget. Uh, 
um, and we look at other factors before that decision is made. Um, in addition to our faculty and staff that are, as I showed you those numbers, that are a percentage of those that receive uh, discounted tuition, you know, we have people of various um, means and various professions. We have pastors and college professors and teachers from other schools that choose to send their kids here. Uh, we have uh, people that are maybe earlier in their career and they don't have the same income level that they will later on. We have single parents. Uh, we have families that um, maybe they, somebody loses their job. And so they go without income or limited income for a year. And so they might receive tuition assistance for a year until they're back on their feet again. We believe as the body of Christ that we, we need to help our, our school community and our families. And um, you know, many of these people are hardworking, intelligent, successful people that have chosen, sometimes they've chosen intentionally to be in professions that may not pay as well. You know, we have college professors in our school community that do four years of college and two years of a master's and six years for a PhD. And 10 years later, you know, they're teaching at UNC Greensboro, let's say, and they have three kids, a family of five, and they're making 50,000 a year. And they're working hard and they're right educated people to say the least, but they have chosen to go into a, a career field that is not as lucrative as some others. We don't want to, uh, to lose families like that if they are a mission-appropriate family that desires this Christ-centered and class of education. We think it's healthy for our whole community to have families um, from different environments. And, um, so, what this variable tuition model does is show you, uh, ah, go to this. Um, our goal, one, is to have greater transparency. Secondly, we want to compensate our faculty and our staff to hire them so that I can retain and recruit and retain the very best teachers that are working with your kids and that we can have the very best school possible. And to do that, we can do one of two things, generally. We could have 20, 30% tuition hikes a couple of years. We could charge what Greensboro Day School does, 21, almost 22,000 a year. I have a feeling, though, that we would not grow our enrollment, but we would lose a lot of families. And that defeats the purpose. We could go from our current 687 students, we could have a 30 or 40 percent tuition hike and have 487 students, and so we're not going to pay our teachers anymore. The other lever is to fill seats. Our maximum occupancy is 780 students. That's not adding classes, it's not filling classes beyond our long-standing uh, uh, cap. We desire to cap a section at 20, three sections per grade, that's 60 students in a grade. Four sections of kindergarten with 15 per section, which would be 60 in kindergarten, moving to three sections of first, three sections of second, all the way through 12th grade, 20 per section, a maximum of 60. That gives us 780 students. We're roughly about 687, 688 uh, right now. So we have about 90, 92, 93 empty seats. So if you have a section of 15 students, Three sections of 15 gives you 45. We can count the section at 20 and grade at 60. That means we would have 15 empty seats. Every seat that we fill is additional revenue that comes in. Without, uh, 
it's very little increase in expense. So if we have, let's say, 50 kids in the fifth grade, and we have 10 empty seats, if we fill, if we add one or two or five or 10 students, we don't add teachers. We don't pay more for electricity. We don't pay more for snow removal tomorrow. We pay a little bit more in curriculum or whatnot, but it, it's pretty, not insignificant, but it's pretty small. But yet that revenue, for every penny that comes in, that's additional revenue. So it doesn't cost us anything on the expense side, but it adds on the revenue side. So if that family is paying um, the full tuition, we add uh, the full tuition. But if they're getting discounted tuition, uh, if it's discounted 10% or 20% or what have you, we're still getting that revenue in. And so it's filling that empty seat. What schools uh, have found, again, that I mentioned a moment ago, when they moved to the variable tuition model, is it's filling those seats. Um, about four, five years ago, uh, my predecessor, Mark Guthrie, uh, found out about variable tuition at the conference, uh, came back very excited, and I remember talking to him about it uh, at the time, but he came back, presented it to his staff, and was really excited about it, but it was still um, really kind of in its infancy at the time, uh, not really proven necessarily to, uh, uh, they didn't know what kind of impact it might have, and so uh, I don't think he brought it to the board and never went anywhere. Um, almost two years ago, in the spring of 2014, right as I was um, interviewing here, I was still in Roanoke, Virginia, uh, the head of school or classical school there, uh, one of our board members saw an article in the Wall Street Journal about tuition. He said, this looks great. He brought me the article, showed it to the board, the board got really excited and said, this is something we need to adopt. Of course, by the time we did that, it was May. You know, it was well past the new season, so it's not going to be something they're going to adopt during my tenure or uh, that next year. But I was charged in May and June of 2014 to make some phone calls, do some research, I uh, looked at several websites and I called three schools. Westchester Country Day, High Point, the Duke School in Durham, and um, a Christian School in California that had all adopted this variable tuition model within the last uh, two, two or three years before that. And all three found, again, a significant increase in enrollment. When I spoke with the head of school at Westchester, um, they saw about a 20% increase in new admissions and about an uh, 8 or 10% increase in enrollment in the first year. Now since that time, I know there's a, a Christian school in Fredericksburg, Virginia, Fredericksburg Christian Academy, um, and another school in California, both within a year of each other adopted this. Both schools had enrollments of about 1,200 prior to the recession. Both schools had dropped about 780 students in a four, five, six year period. Within one year, they each gained 100 students. And um, so from 780 to 880 in one year. All mission appropriate students, not compromising admission standards, but growing the school. That is a way, now there's no guarantee that if, with us doing this that we're going to gain a single extra student. We may have lower enrollment. We may have the same enrollment, or we may gain 100 students. We don't know, but we think over the next two or three years that it's very likely that it will have an impact. <coughs> but even if it doesn't, it's, it's greater transparency in the way we do business of continuing philosophically to do exactly what we've been doing for 21 years. Now, the process, uh, let me show you this, uh, this slide here. Uh, 
Uh, I think most people know that you don't become a teacher to get rich. Uh, teachers notoriously don't make a lot of money. You know, public school teachers don't make a lot of money. The state of North Carolina ranks 40th in the country for public school teachers. So in a profession that's not very lucrative, North Carolina is especially not very lucrative. Uh, in the state of North Carolina, public school teachers uh, start at just under 32, and the median, I couldn't find the high, but the median is just under 50, 40th in the country. Guilford County pays a little bit more, starting salary 39, 350. The high is 70,090. At Caldwell, we start teachers uh, about 28 and a half, that's 72% of the Guilford starting, and um, uh, our pay chart tops us out at uh, about 57 and a half, which is 82% of Guilford. Our teachers have received approximately a 1% pay increase per year the last three years. Our um, health insurance has not increased 1% a year, you know, more like 10 or 15, but like many years as well. But we, we have teachers with a master's degree, 15 years of teaching experience, maybe three kids, maybe two of them might be here at Caldwell, a uh, family of five, making 34000 a year. It, we've been blessed that we have extraordinary teachers. I would put our teachers up against any school in the state of North Carolina, public or private. But for us to continue recruiting and retaining the best teachers, we need to do something about this. Without raising tuition 20, 30%, or 10% a year for three or four consecutive years, because we don't think that's going to work and we don't want to do that to you. So we want to fill seats. We want to grow from that 680 to 720, 740, up to 780. And any revenue that we get in uh, for those new students, full pay or discounted tuition, helps us do increase this compensation, which then helps your children because of the quality teachers that we continue to, to attract and retain. Okay, again, this is, uh, this is the current year tuition we have. You compare this against that, that first list that I showed you. Uh, it's, it's quite a good deal. And with our, our new tuition, we're going up 5%. Historically, we have averaged about 3 to 5% increase annually. And, and most private schools do. Um, our expenses, many of our expenses are going up at a much higher rate than the cost of living. Uh, the uh, mechanical systems in our buildings that are getting, you know, they're getting older, they're now, um, a lot of money has to go into those, and so that's a much higher increase than the cost of living, or three to five percent, and then again to get our teacher salaries up and some of these other things. Um, so there have been some years that we've had more, uh, significantly more than a five percent increase in tuition to try to get our tuition up to uh, closer to where it needs to be. In other years, it's been more like two and a half or three percent. So this 5% increase is in range of our historical norms. And really in this climate, especially post-recession, we really can expect most years to have that 3 to 5% increase. So that's no different. This published range shows the lower end and then the full tuition. And this is about 49%, just under 50% of the top end. It's not that we were going to have a lot, that we currently have a lot of students, or that we would have a lot of students in the coming years that are paying nothing or paying only 10% or 20% of tuition. Generally speaking, we ask families to pay at a minimum half. So that empty seat that's being filled 
the, the, those that are receiving the deepest discount, the greatest aid, are still paying a significant amount based on demonstrated need. Now another way of potentially showing this, um, okay, we see here the same thing that I just showed you. Uh, we, we currently have this presented on our web page uh, in a similar way. Uh, we have toured the idea. We could list our tuition and then show from another angle the amount of assistance or aid um, that would range at these levels from this amount of assistance up to this amount, really from about 12% award to this 49% award. If the, the current 75% of our families that don't get discounted tuition, nothing changes. You continue to march, I used to say in the Army, um, the same way you've always done. If you don't think you qualify for a discounted tuition, for the tuition assistance, you complete your application and nothing changes. You, you don't submit any financial information to us or to Independent School Management, ISM. Those families that feel like, well, perhaps I might qualify for some level of this variable tuition, this discount. Then you would apply again confidentially to this third party event, who then makes the recommendation back to us based on their formula of the various uh, financial ability that you might have. Uh, again, income is one piece of that, but it's, it's far more than that. It does not include retirement. Retirement income does not need to be reported on that. Um, retirement uh, investments. But um, so, again, the majority of people, at least those that are paying um, uh, the listed tuition, the, the full price tuition, uh, again, things don't change. Those who, um, who wish to, um, and, and it may be that you apply, you don't get an award. Not everyone who applies for discounted tuition currently, historically, and going forward with this variable tuition is necessarily going to receive assistance. Uh, it's based on the demonstrated need. And so, um, um, some people ask, well, how, how do I know if I qualify? Or how do I know how much aid I might receive? It's a hard question for us to answer because everyone's situation is different. It's not our desire or our need to dig into your own personal financial information, which is what it would require us to do to give you that assessment. It's the whole reason we use ISM. You know, you can have two families each making, let's pull a number out of a hat, $90,000 a year in total family income. You know, family A, may have hundreds of thousands of dollars in investments and maybe have one child in kindergarten at that lowest range of tuition. Family B might have a salary, family salary of 90000 but they have no savings, lots of student loans and debt and that, and maybe they have five kids at Caldwell. The award is going to be rather different from those two families, even though their salaries are the same. So we can't say, oh, if you make 90000 this is what you're going to pay in tuition. It's, um, you know, it, it's too tough to, to make that kind of statement. So hence, you apply through ISM and, um, and let them make the recommendation. But again, they make the recommendation. They don't determine the award. We know what our budget is. We know what we can afford to pay. And um, with our current enrollment, if we stay at the same enrollment next year, which is essentially what um, this increase from 5.5% of our budget to about 6.2%, that's assuming that we go up four or five students. Now, if we go up 50 students, 
we're going to have a whole lot more revenue, which means the percentage would not increase, but the amount of dollars that we would discount would then increase. So there's no fixed. It's not like we're only going to pay X amount in discounted tuition. It depends on that enrollment. So um, um, I think. get some of the mechanics out of here. Um, Bill, you want to, Bill has a, you pretend you're in church, he has a testimony here. <laughs> yeah, can I get a whip a second? Um, I just want to share a little bit about my story, um, because we were faced with a dilemma um, back in 2005. Um, I worked for VF Corporation here in town. Um, I was a software analyst with them. Had a great job. Um, I loved my job and was doing well. And in 2001, I had been the treasurer of Grace Community Church since the early 90s. And just really felt just, I don't know, calling or whatever to go to work for the church. And so I did in 2001. Um, well, I took a pretty significant pay cut uh, to do that, but we were, we had thought about that over the years. We didn't have any debt. Um, our mortgage was fairly low. And so, uh, made that jump in 2001 to, um, to go to work at Grace. And uh, our youngest, no, our oldest child started at Caldwell in 1999. We still had to make it, we still had to cover expenses and all that. Well, in, um, in 2005, I was looking at the re-enrollment at that time and said to my wife, we can't do this. The, the numbers don't work. I said, we don't have enough income to make this happen. She was working part-time for Young Life at that point. Um, I was working at Grace. Uh, our income in 2004, just to lay it out there, um, our household income was $68,000 between the two of us. So we... We had a fixed amount. We were, you know, I was working um, six days a week. Um, Sunday was a work day. We were working in the church, and um, but we had, you know, we had no debt, we had no mortgage, but the numbers just weren't going to work having two kids in the grammar school. And so, reluctantly, the thought of having to pull our kids from Caldwell was was there. We were looking at alternatives um, to that, and I spoke with Adam Greer about it, and. Um, he said, well, have you applied for tuition assistance? And I said, what's that? I had no idea. Um, and he said, talk to Mark. Find out about it. And so we applied, and they bridged the gap to help my kids stay here. And they continued um, for the next several years. In 2008, I was hired. Um, they called call well, and that was great. But for those intervening years, um, 2005, 6, and 7, Having that tuition assistance to bridge that gap is a thing that kept us here for the remaining years, but then also um, a lot of the kids who graduated from Caldwell, they wouldn't have done it. Um, my youngest is at Alabama now, and if she hadn't hung out with Julie Gasmeri for a year and been encouraged to do that, I don't know where she'd be. Um, I, I don't know what it would look like. I don't want to think about what it would look like. So um, that's just our story, and it's not that you know we weren't working hard, it's just we need some help. And so a few years, that worked. And so that's when folks come to me and, you know, are trying to work out the numbers and stuff. I said, just apply. Let's see if we can work it out. Let's, let's see if we can make work. Um, because, uh, you know, this isn't a system. And if somebody wants to game a system, they can game a system. But um, I don't think we have, we have like-minded folks here that are you know, working hard trying to make things work. And, um, I just wanted to share this personal story about what does this really look like, um, and just a brief conversation with Adam Greer about this because I didn't know about it. So that's why we're trying to get this out there. So, what are your questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
faculty and staff receive discounted tuition off of that, but if they still, many of them might qualify for tuition assistance on top of that, because they don't get a, a huge discount um, for their kids. And so, um, you know, depending upon their financial situation, you know, they might be married to someone that has a large salary, so they wouldn't qualify for assistance beyond that. Others, they have a, they're the breadwinner, and so they qualify for assistance beyond that. Yes, sir. In terms of teacher salaries, you have, it's hard because you don't know how many, if it's if the uh, student base points to meet the number. Do you have any targets that you're trying to get to eventually to make the salaries? Uh, targets for salaries? Or? I would like to have, and in our strategic plan, we have a strategic plan that we're now in year one, six months into a five year plan. And a part of that plan is to get teacher salaries up to, I think it's 90% of Guilford County from, from starting teacher to senior teacher. We're also looking at independent schools because it's sometimes easier to compare ourselves to private schools as opposed to public schools, but, um, uh, you know, a, a base is 90% of the Thank you for the question. What else? Yes, ma'am. So, the recommendation, once you receive the recommendation from the third party, what, how is that presented to, um, the committee? Is it presented in such just one number, like family A? Bill, Bill kind of handles... This the, is a recommendation for family A, or does it list out some of their financial information? I'm more concerned with the financial information sharing. Um, <clears throat> the, yeah, I take, I handle the details of that, and basically, we try and get everybody, or as many people as possible, to apply at once. And then we basically download what is the recommendation, um, what are the kids applying for? What schools are they applying for? Because um, at different times we've allocated, say, a different break in kindergarten versus a break in high school or something like that. So we download that in bulk by person. How are their kids breaking out? What is the recommendation for the um, uh, for the award? And then, okay, if their kids are you know a kindergartner and a middle schooler, then and if we could hit 25% of kindergarten and 35% of middle school, here's what the award would be, and then that total down. Okay, so you don't really see any financial information pertaining to that family, you just kind of get a number, basically. No, it, we, have, we do have access to it. Okay. It is there, okay. just in transparency. I don't download that uh -huh. in order to bring it to the committee to make the decisions, because ISM is really making that. And when something nobody else like, on the committee sees that at all, and Bill typically does not. The, the, he, has, he has the ability to, but he's the only one that can look into that. The only time I do look into it is when something just doesn't seem right. Okay. Um, you know, let's say, you know, I may know the family that's applying, and they said um, that they were not awarded anything. Like, what is going on there? Because that, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I, I, right. I see folks. Or if it's a, you know, it could go the other way, I don't know, but just when it's out of whack, when something just doesn't look right with it, we'll dig into it. I'm not gonna download it onto the spreadsheet because April, Sam, nobody else needs to see that information, but it can help provide some background. Oh, well they have an right. inheritance that did this, and so that's why. And it's often it's really kind of an appeal process. If, if you're not granted an award, think you should be based on your financial needs or let's say you're only given a uh, 15% award and think wait I can't I can't do that for that then you can choose to kind of bear all but then that's your choice because you're appealing to bill on the committee um, but if you accept the award that's given and it's not our right then uh, there's no need for bill Comments or questions? Yes, sir. So, I, I mean, I don't think anybody disagrees with tuition assistance or anything like that. I, 
I do wonder though about the, the presentation of it in the email. I think that was that, that probably could have been better. Uh, that's probably why there you know, there was a lot of a lot of questions and concerns. Did you guys? I know you guys did a lot of research to to get to this point to you know the board and, and just deciding to implement. <coughs> Was there, was, I guess, did you look at ways that other schools announced it or rolled it out? Yes. Um, good question. And in retrospect, you know, hindsight's always 2020. And there are things that, that I should have included in that, you know, maybe worded things differently that would have been better. But in our evolving days of communication, that first letter was two pages, with the intent of having a follow-up letter, which we did, uh, that had more of the details, which was, I think, three pages, so five pages total. Most of us, many of us, we read that information on our smartphone at a red light. And as we finish the first paragraph, and the person behind us is honking their horn, we put it away, and whatever that first impression um, for instance, in the last paragraph of the first letter, I mentioned that we would have an informational Q&A meeting. And I got about five or six people that sent me emails that said, well, are you going to have an informational session? Case in point, we don't read. So we did discuss that we put more specific information in the first that we know a lot of people aren't going to read anyway. Or do we just put it out there and then say there's going to be follow-up information. The other schools, and I ultimately spoke to six or seven schools, and they had very similar presentations. In fact, I sent my letter to two other schools before it was sent out that had, that had done it in the last year, one a year ago, one two years ago. And both schools, they said, wonderful. This is great. And no school had any pushback when they did theirs. And um, so we have probably six or eight staff members. I mean, the number of man hours on the first letter was probably 30 or 40 man hours, uh, as well as, you know, again, sending out to 200 uh, schools. And, um, but in retrospect, there were things in there that did not fully reveal what people wanted to hear, you know, uh, it, it left questions. So yeah, we, we could have done a better job. I could have done a better job of communicating that. And this this is great. So this this makes sense. I think that's yeah. And and sometimes these types of announcement is it's a um, it's a progression. You know, you go from one letter and then you fill out more information with the second letter and then you have a face to face with both presentation and Q and A. Kind of fills in the gaps. Um, so I do encourage, we, we have maybe about 50 people here this morning, 30 or so of you. If, um, if you go out and you know, our best communicators are you, the most effective, um, and uh, whether you're sharing good news or bad news, you are the most effective communicator. So tell others. Uh, we, we have both this morning and this afternoon session um, that are taped, and so if, if people want to watch these, this presentation, they can. <clears throat> Folks are always welcome to schedule a time to come talk to me. Uh, and if you're here today, if you have questions that, you, that you're uncomfortable about asking and, and publicly, please don't hesitate to make an appointment and come talk to me. Or you can talk to Bill or April. <coughs> In your presentation, you gave two different web presentations for how this could be laid out, for how we get the information out to the public. It's one thing to talk to your public family, but another to the public. Is there one that particularly strikes the court as being more effective? Um, good question. We kind of wanted to get a response maybe from you. The um, This is what every school, and I've been to maybe 20 websites, schools that have done this, maybe 25. 
Every single one is done it this way. And this is the way we, we've gone ahead and, and put some numbers on our website and we've presented it this way. Um, Bill Bishop and I, um, he was grabbing dinner a couple hours ago in one location. I was grabbing dinner at another location. I think we are both away from our families. And we talked about how I wonder if this might be, because again, this is philosophically and mechanically no different than what we've ever done. It's all about the presentation, transparency and marketing. And so we thought, okay, is this perhaps a better way to, uh, to present this? So I don't know what you guys think. If you, if you think this is a better way to present it, I, I see several heads no, several heads yes. <laughs> that, that's difficult. That's <laughs> I mean, just my first thought about this is I've got the same people. I mean, I tried for a couple of years to get a friend to send her daughter to Baltimore. She was a full-time nursing student who was working at Mrs. Cohen, and a single mother would have definitely qualified for the commission assistance. But, you know, I mean, for a year, I'm not going to qualify. You know, there, there's not a connect to what you would qualify as an assistance. I think the variable range is in there. It's maybe a bigger question mark. It's worth at least investigating. So, this is a bigger question mark, or this, this is a bigger question mark? Well, I think that gets written off faster. This gets written off faster? Yeah. I mean, in my mind. <coughs> So to accomplish what you're, I mean, to, to do all of this, and I feel like the, this might sit better with people who are not currently at Caldwell, but to accomplish I understand that. Better. Yeah, I understand that, and that, that might be. So we'll just better. show you guys this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, I mean, to accomplish what you want to do, that was part of it. I mean, I should look at it and said, hey, maybe it's $4,000 a year. I could do that. I didn't think I could qualify for it. Maybe put the Yep, because I mean I, I was at the first meeting and I don't want to be here to take what I said, but, but the gist of it was that that to me says that I can earn the four thousand for The other one to me says, wow, this place must be awesome. They're gonna they're gonna allow me to go and have some assistance. I really appreciate the system that they have and I love the school. So for me, that is more of, I don't know, maybe not appreciated as much. I can just get that. The other one to me seems more of that we are giving school and we are all systems. I mean, I, I get that, but which one of them gets someone to actually call April? I mean,
you all get to a discounted tuition. <laughs> Actually, we could give him another present. What's that? We could give him another present. What's that? We can give him tomorrow after school. <laughs> <laughs> Which, Joe came in, you guys are the first to know the text message is getting ready to go out. We are gonna, not going to have school tomorrow. I did this one other time in Roto. There's a 100% chance that it's going to be a Yeah, but. Yes, sir. Right there. So, could you guys also look at an endowment? What do it take? So, we, we've got, what was it? Three forty five, okay, so like three fifty. If you had even if you had another hundred students and the average was five thousand or another five hundred thousand, oh really? What would what would it what would it take to provide a million dollars a year to tuition assistance? An endowment <coughs> kind of the rule of thumb, five percent a year. So a million dollar endowment would be about fifty thousand. So let's say four hundred thousand of scholarship money, $8 million? $16 million. $16 million. So, um, it, it, it's a eight. Oh, it's a eight. Um, come on, why? Um, so it takes a long time. Now, my goal is for us to build an endowment that will help with teacher salaries and will help with tuition. And so when you're redoing your wills, remember us. But um, talk to your parents and your grandparents. But um, but you know, typically it's schools that are 100 years old, 150 years old. Um, my niece and nephew graduated from school in Atlanta, K-12 school that has a $300 they also have four billionaire families in the school that, you know, and so it, and their tuition is 22000 a year for a kid. But, uh, but they have the same model. Not, not you know, that variable tuition, but the tuition assistance. Um, your annual fund dollars, some people this morning kind of mistaken thinking, okay, well, I thought I thought every year when I gave the annual fund just went directly towards scholarships or tuition assistance. It does, but it also goes to teacher salaries and purchasing curriculum and paying for the fellows that are going to remove the snow tomorrow. You know, it just goes back to the operating budget. It's not exclusively for tuition. And um, so, um, it goes back to everything in the operating room. Yeah, but I would love to develop an endowment and have a scholarship pool. Or it could be down the road that it would be some combination. You know, if we had a two or three million dollar endowment and maybe we, we allocated a hundred thousand dollars of that towards providing scholarships, and then maybe the rest of that was discounted tuition, the same model. So there's, there's different ways to do that. But that's why um, um, most K-12 schools, especially these 300 or so classical schools in the country, virtually all of us are 30 years old or younger. And virtually all of us have zero endowments or you know, $50,000 in endowment or whatever. So we don't have an endowment pool for scholarships, so it has to be. Yes, ma'am. Quick question. Now that you've got this together, it works together, how is it going to be marketed going forward? The charter schools are a huge draw from, I think, what would have been our pool in the past. Sure. Well, one part is on the website and having it pretty much front and center affordability, accessibility, and Caldwell Academy. People open that up and they immediately see that there's a tuition range. That speaks volumes. The, as I mentioned before, the best marketers are you. Uh, we can pay tens of thousands of dollars a year for advertisements, for mailings, for billboards, for radio and TV time, and it pales 
compared to what you tell your neighbors and the folks in your church and the folks in the scouts and whatever. And so um, you tell like, your friends the great things of Caldwell, but then also say, you know what, you may qualify for this very intuition. That is great marketing. But say both of that, we, we are planning, uh, April just left, but um, um, with Lisa and April, uh, just some, some marketing, uh, really for the whole school, everything about the school, and this is a piece of that. And any, any ideas that you have, Thank you. See you guys. Yeah, people need to leave. You, you got a long time before the snow might come.